Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Dante Fortson here with Nephilim Giants Part 3, Goliath and the Anakim. So today we're going to get into some stuff that takes place in the Valley of the Giants, a little bit of the invasion of the Promised Land, not the whole thing. Uh, there's a lot going on in the Promised Land. Uh, but before we get to that, let me go ahead and shout out these prayer requests. Uh, Yoruba, his finance prayers were answered. Tanya gets real needs prayer for her family's health issues. Yashika Black. Her husband's salvation and restored marriage. Delois, family feels like it's being torn apart. Nicole, her anger problems. Tracy, her children's salvation. Courtney, Braden, and Bryce. Destin, skin inflammation and hyperpigmentation. And shout outs to Michael and Adrian for following up and praying for these people in the forums. If you would like a prayer um, request read out loud during or before one of the studies, go ahead to um, bhitbforums.com and drop your prayer request in the forums. Um, if you want to get into some interesting conversations, there are two going on right now, one on wisdom being the Holy Spirit and another on sacrifice. So if you want to have your input in those conversations, make sure you jump in the forums. Feel free to start your own topics and I'll shout out some of the uh, topics. If you guys drop something interesting and a lot of people start to comment, uh, make sure to shout that out as well. And again, go to bhitbforums.com, sign up and start posting in the forum. For those that want to support, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Dante Fortson. Uh, if you want to support via Cash App, it's cash tag B-H-I-T-B. Shout out to everybody who has been supporting via Cash App. I appreciate it. Uh, PayPal support link is in the description. And of course, if you catch the live premiere, you can always uh, support via Super Chat by clicking the dollar sign in the chat window. And lastly, those who asked for cryptocurrency wallet uh, information, that is now in the description for those who wanted to support using crypto. I appreciate that as well. And for those who can't support financially, a share and a prayer are always appreciated, especially the prayers and the shares. <laughs> so today's study is brought to you by as the days of Noah were the sons of God in the coming apocalypse. In that book, I talk about the sons of God, the fallen angels, which we've gone over in this series. And I talk about a lot of the uh, stuff concerning Nephilim giants, which we are going over now. And I'm also I'm also going to point out something that I wrote back in 2010. Um, I'm not going to give the exact quote, but just kind of paraphrase the idea because uh, it was a couple pages long. Um, yeah, you'll see that when we get to it. But it was published in the original um, first edition of As the Days of Noah Were in 2010. And I'll talk about that when we get there. And Beyond Flesh and Blood, The Ultimate Guide to Angels and Demons. So if you want a in-depth look into the spiritual realm uh the different kind of spirits that are described in the bible it's not just angels and demons i'm not sure why people say that when they haven't done a study on the full book but if you study the full book it's not just angels and demons that are mentioned there are other things mentioned as well uh so if you want to um get a good understanding on that grab that book as well both of them are available on amazon.com and barnesandnoble.com all right so click the thumbs up if you haven't already done so if you are not subscribed, please click the subscription button. And if you are subscribed, please click the notification bell and click all notifications. That way you'll get an alert about I think it's 30 minutes before the show starts and then one minute before it starts. So make sure you do that. All notifications if you don't want to miss anything. All right. So we're going to start out today's study with a verse that takes us back to part one of this series because a lot of this stuff is going to come up. And again, context is important because there are a lot of false teachers out there teaching the um, the Nephilim gene theory that that the Nephilim gene got off the ark after God killed everybody for no reason. And he allowed the Nephilim gene to survive on the ark and then they repopulated. That's not true. And I'm going to show you why that's not true more in depth today. So there were this is Genesis 6, 4. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown or men of great fame or famous men. And we're going to talk about several of them today. So this scenario is going to take place in Canaan in the Valley of the Giants. And we're going to get deeper into the Valley of the Giants and some of the giant monuments uh, throughout this series. Today, I'm just going to show you a picture of a giant monument. We're not going to get deep into any giant monuments on this study, uh, but I'm going to dedicate a whole study to giant monuments around the world and their legends. And this is coming from Joshua chapter 15, verse 8, where it references the Valley of the Giants. And the border went up by the Valley of the Son of Hinnom unto the south side of the Jebusite. 
The same is Jerusalem. And the border went up to the top of the mountain that lieth before the valley of Hinnom westward, which is at the end of the valley of the giants northward. So this is important because some of these people that are out here teaching Genesis and um, Exodus, well, the whole you know first five books, they will say that these giants are allegorical or metaphorical or they weren't really giants or people were just short back then. And so they looked at tall people like giants. They, they come up with ways to strip the Bible of the supernatural. And I always find it, it, it's weird when they draw the line at angels having sex with humans and producing giants, but they believe in a, in a uncreated, all-powerful being that brought everything into existence out of nothing and then used clay to mold a man, blew the breath of life into him, and then took his rib out to create a woman, and then a talking serpent. Now, I don't believe it was a serpent in the literal sense, but a lot of them do. A talking serpent tricked humanity into sinning, and that's how death came into the world. So, I mean, you could get on and on and on about talking donkeys and everything else that happens in the Bible, and yet people draw the line at angels having sex. And I just find that to be strange. So, when they went into the promised land, they sent in 12 spies, one spy from each tribe. And two of those spies were Caleb. Caleb is from the tribe of Judah and Joshua is from the tribe of Ephraim. And they're going to go in these 12 spies and only two spies come out with a good report. And so we're going to um, cover that section of text today because we get a lot of insight about what's going on in the promised land. And some people teach that their report is a lie, which is why we partly need to address this. They, they say an evil report is a lie. And yet we're going to see that what they said is not a lie and it's confirmed in multiple parts in scripture and it's not just coming from them. So numbers chapter 13 is where we're going to be dealing with today for the most part. Uh, verse 22 is where we're going to start and they ascended. This is um, after the spies go into the land and they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron where Ahiman, Shishai and Talmai, the children of Anak were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. All right, so we get three names here. Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, the children of Anak. This is what they see. This is, they're, they're describing what happened when they're spying out the land here. So we just have to understand the order of events. And then we're going to address why it was a factual report. And they came unto the brook of Eskel and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs the place was called the brook of Eskel because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence now um if you remember when we covered uh Abraham Eskel and um Eskel was one of the brothers of Manar um Mamar one of the Amorites so I pointed out that they were giants and it may be that this was called Eskel because it says the giant because they, the grapes were giant. The stuff was giant in the land. So, again, that may be a connection. So the children of Israel cut uh, let's see, children of Israel cut down from thence and they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. So they're telling you how long they were in the land. They're describing what they saw. They saw these giant grapes. They saw the children of Anak. They give you the names the reason they have the names is because they're spies and they've been there for over a month. So they're they're learning information. They have the names of locations and people and they they're telling you the direction of where everybody is. Well, we'll get to that part in a second. And they returned from searching out the land for after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and to un and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, we came unto a land whither thou sentest us and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. So here's what we have. We have these guys come back. They bring evidence that they were in the land. They said, everything is exactly as you said it was. He said, and here's the evidence that everything is exactly as you said it was. Now, here is where the story changes because it seems like everything is all good. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled. 
This is important. Pay attention to this part because we're, we're going to come back to this in the book of Deuteronomy. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, or more importantly, we saw the children of Anak there. That's how it's, that's how I started off in verse 22. They named the children of Anak. That's an important part that happened when they were spying out the land. They saw the children of Anak. Now, he said, more importantly, he said, look, we brought back the big cluster of grapes. Everything is exactly as you said it was. The people are strong. The cities are walled. But more importantly, we saw these three guys here that we named. Um, let me go back so I get the names right. Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai. More importantly, we saw the children of Anak. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. So now they're telling you what they spied out. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb, tribe of Judah, stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. So now Caleb did not say these people are lying. He didn't say these men aren't telling the truth. He didn't say any of that. He said we can beat them. So for those that teach that this was a false report in order to avoid the whole Nephilim situation. You have a problem because now you have to explain why Caleb and Joshua didn't just call these guys outright liars. Instead, he said, we can go up and take it. We are, we are able to overcome it. Verse 31. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report. This is the part right here where people try to say, well, that means they were lying. No, it just means bad. They brought up a bad report of the place and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people we saw in it are men of great stature. So cannibalism comes up again. The land eats up the inhabitants thereof. We covered cannibalism before among the giants. All the men are of great stature. They're, they're saying it in different ways. And this is for those that don't believe these were literal giants. First, they're going to say great stature. Then they're going to call them right here. And there we saw the giants or the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants or the Nephilim. And we were born. We were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. So now they link them to the Nephilim. Now, the only time Nephilim is used prior to this is in Genesis six. So there is a natural linkage there, especially if you believe that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. If the same author is using the same word in two different places, it's intentional because he uses Rapha in Genesis um, chapter 14. when We studied um, Sodom and Gomorrah. So now we look back at the Nephilim verses. How did the Nephilim get there? The sons of God came down to the daughters of men. And they took wives of all which they chose. Some people will say, well, it doesn't explain how they got there after the flood. It does. If you use common sense and common English, it says in those days and also after that. Again, we went over the conjunction. We, we went over how conjunctions work. It, the before and after are connected. And then there's one single explanation. You don't need two different explanations when you use a conjunction. If I say I get off Monday and Tuesday at five o'clock. You don't expect me to get off Monday at five o'clock and then Tuesday a whole different time. It just doesn't make sense. And yet some people will try to use that logic to reason that, well, it didn't explain the after. Yes, it does. And so here Moses is linking the Nephilim, the sons of Anak to the Nephilim in Genesis six. So he's telling you these guys are scared of hybrids, giant hybrids, angel human hybrids. And we're going to see some other interesting stuff. And right here to the right in this picture, you see Gilgal Raphaim. This is located in the Valley of the Giants. And we're going to get into that later. Um, this is a giant structure located in the Valley of the Giants. There's other there's other giant structures such as Petra, Baalbek, and some of the others we're going to get into. And those of you who watch Ancient Aliens, you're probably familiar with some of those structures already. So here we have, they're referred to as great stature. That's something to tell you it's literal. Then he says, we saw the Nephilim. It tells you their linkage, their angel human hybrids that were called giants. So again, they want you to know it's literal. He says the sons of Anak who they named. So they have literal names. These are literal people. It says they come from the Nephilim. So again, they're telling you that these are the literal descendants of the Nephilim. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. Now they're using simile. He said, we look like grasshoppers to ourselves and we look like grasshoppers to them. He's giving comparisons, how tall they were. Find a grasshopper, stand next to it. 
And you'll see the kind of comparison that they're trying to tell you. These people were big. They weren't just short people. They weren't just five, three. And these people were six foot or seven foot. And they're calling them giants over exaggerating like some of the people teach. So why were the people? So hold on. Let me not get to the why yet. That'll jump ahead of this. So the people were afraid. So the, the first the 10 spies are afraid. And now the whole congregation becomes afraid. Now, let me point out how afraid they were, which tells you that these were literal giants, literal offspring of fallen angels and all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried all the congregation and the people wept that night and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation said unto them would God that we had died in the land of Egypt or would God we have died in the wilderness or basically it would have been better that we died in Egypt or better that we died in the wilderness and wherefore or why hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return unto Egypt? Now, here's where it gets very, very weird if you don't accept the Nephilim explanation. And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. Now, understand, they had just been freed from harsh slavery, the harsh slavery that they were crying to God to free them from. They get out here. The 10 spies come back and say, hey, the Nephilim are in the land. Now, understand, they know what the Nephilim are from Genesis six. They understand what the Nephilim are. They understand their history. And they say, you know what? Let's just pick us another leader and go back into slavery. This is how afraid they were. They would have rather gone un back under Egyptian slavery than have to deal with the Nephilim, the angel human hybrids that were out there in the promised land. These were literal giants. They weren't afraid of seven foot or six foot tall people. They wouldn't have gone back into slavery because somebody's a foot taller than them. If you believe that they're five, three Shaquille O'Neal couldn't make somebody that's five foot tall, go back into slavery. It, it just doesn't make sense. When you have a group of people, a group of people would fight somebody Shaquille O'Neal's height with no problem. They wouldn't say, you know what, let's just all of us go back into slavery rather than fight Shaquille O'Neal. And I'm get, just giving you that so you have the height difference. It's just, it's not realistic. Now, I'm going to point out something too, because we talked about this in the Gentile study about the word et right here. 853 et, Aleph and the Tau. It's untranslated in lots of places, and I pointed that out before. So in context, this verse actually... Um, indicates that all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried and all the people wept that night from the start to the finish of the night. This was all, all night weeping from the whole congregation of Israel, all of them. This is how terrified they were. And remember, they had all that evidence that the land was great. And he said, but more importantly, we saw these three guys. This is three guys, three. They named three. They had the whole of Israel shook. So why were they in fear? We find this out in Deuteronomy chapter nine, verses one through two. Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself. This is confirmation that they weren't lying. They said this cities great and fenced up to the heaven. They said this. The, the cities were fortified and a people great and tall. Again, they, they called them great stature. They called them giants. So this is confirming what was already said in numbers. The children of the Anakims. Whom thou knowest. So now we understand why the people were scared and they were trembling. They knew who the Anakim were. The people were aware of who they are. It says, and of whom thou hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak? So they were giants. They were part angel. And there were legends, legendary men. Didn't we read in Genesis? The same became mighty men, men of renown, well-known men, famous men. These were literal giants. So that. Anakim, those three guys, and there's going to be possibly two more, the father um, and possibly the grandfather being still alive. So we're going we're going to talk about some of that in a second. But the children of Anak is what they keep saying. So they didn't seem to be as concerned about Anak himself, nor were they concerned about Anak's father. And the reason I bring that up is because some people believe that Nephilim were sterile. If you get into the white Christian communities, L.A. Marzulli, um, Steve Quayle, Rob Skiba, those types of um, fringe Christian communities that I was involved in way back in 2010. Now, 
Understand that a lot of them have referenced my work. And if you don't believe me, you can go back and fact check it yourself. L.A. Marzulli said himself that um, Days of Noah was the definitive work on the Nephilim. Steve Quayle shouted me out on Hagman and Hagman for uh, having some of the best Sethite research he had ever encountered. Rob Skiba wrote me personally and asked permission to use my research in his book, um, Babylon Rising, in his first book. So I was around back then doing all this stuff involved with all these guys when all a lot of this foundation was being laid after Chuck Missler touched on it. And so you start to see in these in these verses that there are genealogies, even though that some of them, not not the people I named necessarily, but some people in those circles teach that these hybrids were sterile and they couldn't have children. And yet we're about to find an entire genealogy of giants in the Bible. Joshua 14, 13 through 15. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Hebron for an inheritance. Heb or Hebron, Hebron, therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron before was Kerjeth Arba, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. So this is in the book of Joshua. And it says Arba was a great man. Now, I didn't pull up the um, Strong's reference, but you can go check it yourself. Biblehub.com. Uh, type in Joshua chapter four. Uh, I believe that's verse 15. And then click interlinear. All right. And after you click interlinear, click the word great. And it'll show you that one of the possible interpretation is elder. So Arba was either a great man or an elder among the Anakims. It could mean both. It, it doesn't really change the context in any way, shape or form. Now here, this is just a general statement. And we say, okay, he, the Anakim, they're scared of the Anakim and he's a great man among the Anakim. But when you get to Joshua chapter 15, we find out who Arba is. It says, and unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he gave a part among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, or sorry, father of Anak, which city is Hebron or Hebron. That's Joshua 15 verse 13. So we find out Arba is the father of Anak, which means Arba couldn't have been sterile. Why do we know Arba's a Nephilim? Because Anak has to be a Nephilim if his children are Nephilim. Because remember they said there we saw the um, Nephilim, the sons of Anak. So if the sons of Anak are a Nephilim, that means Anak's a Nephilim, which if his father's Arba, that means Arba's a Nephilim. But we don't get an origin for Arba, probably because he was fathered directly by a, fa a fallen angel. So what we're seeing here is there are at least three generations of Nephilim. Arba, generation one. Anak, generation two. And the children of Anak, Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai are generation three. And then we see it again in Joshua chapter 21, verse 11. And they gave them the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah, with the suburbs thereof round about it. So we covered Arba. So let's look at Anak. Now Anak, the name means neck. It says a Canaanite. Now, when we go deeper into the Brown Driver Briggs, we see it says um, right here, long necked, tall men, early giant people about Hebron and in Philistia. So this is important right here. Long necked, tall men, early giant people about Hebron and Philistia. The name means long necked. Now, if you get into some of the African cultures, I was aware of these because I saw these. Now, they have a culture where they put these rings around their neck. And these are the, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right. So if I'm not, forgive me for the mispronunciation, but you guys know I'm not good with foreign words. The Northern Indebele people. They speak Bantu and they are from Zimbabwe. And the first thing I thought about was the Limba. So they might be Hebrews or Israelites. Their culture, um, from what I was reading, the women will put the rings around their neck and it's a. It's a status symbol. And if a woman is married, the man will give her more and more rings to put around her neck. And the more rings a woman has, the richer the husband is. And so. I just briefly read through that culture because I thought it was interesting. I want to see if there was any tie into the Nephilim at all whatsoever. And I didn't find any mention in that in the research that I was doing. 
Now, we're going to get back into the Bible because I'm going to show you something else in a second. So now, Numbers 13, 22, And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where Ahiman, Shishai, Talmai, and the children, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now, Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. As I pointed out, the sons of Anak were a third generation of giants, which means hybrids are not sterile. Now, this picture again. This picture seems to be, I guess, like this. The, the background to this picture, the history of this picture seems to be interesting when you look partway across the world, when you see another culture that has the same exact tradition and yet they have a completely different story of the origin of this tradition. And so I, again, I couldn't find anything linked to fallen angels in this African culture or maybe Israelite culture. Again, I haven't done the research on these people to conclude that they're Israelites or not, but I haven't found anything associated with fallen angels or Nephilim or giants as to why they stretch their necks. And again, this comes from the Anakim. So then... I kept digging and I come across the Kayan or Kayan people from Myanmar. Now it says here, the Kayans or Kayans, this is from Wikipedia, the link is in the description. The Kayans or Kayans traditional religion is called Kan Kwan and has been practiced since the people migrated from Mon Mongolia during the Bronze Age. It includes the belief that the Kayan people are the result of a union between a female dragon and a male human angel hybrid. And again, this link is in the description of Wikipedia. You go there, you click traditional religion, and it'll take you right down to this quote that I just copy and pasted into this um, presentation. Now, think about that. They have a very similar tradition to this. And their tradition is linked to them descending from a male human angel hybrid. Now, forget the dragon part and all that stuff. I just find it interesting that they would even include that in their history at all. They claim to be direct descendants of the Nephilim. Now, this is interesting because, as I pointed out in 2010, when I wrote when I first wrote as the days of Noah were, um, one of the discussions that was floating around was where are all the hybrids? If it's supposed to be like the days of Noah, where are all the, the Nephilim hybrids? Where are all the giants? And people thought there were going to be giants walking around and stuff like that. And I always said in my book, I said that it would seem more logical if they were tampering with DNA to come up with something less obvious than a giant, especially in our day, day and age. It would be nothing to kill a giant. Now, if David killed one with a stone and a slingshot. We have missiles and bullets and everything else. A giant is no problem to deal with in modern times. So it would make more sense to breed out the giant part and have them walking among us looking like regular humans, especially since the intent the first time was um, what do we call it, um, biological warfare, you could call it, where they tampered with the um, human DNA and got angel DNA mixed up into it. So here you have a group of people that claim to be direct descendants from the Nephilim. Now, I find it interesting because when you look at her face and you look at this face, you f you see some interesting things. Now, the reason this is relevant for those that don't know and haven't really been in this topic and in this field and talk to these people, you will find that there's a an occurrence when you're dealing with the supernatural. There are mainly three types of beings that show up during what are called alien abductions. And we're going to look at the book of Acts um, when we get into the angel study. And there's an event that occurs in the book of Acts that is that has every single element of an alien abduction. And again, my official position is that I believe these are fallen angels. Now, there are the Nordics, which are blonde haired, blue eyed, white aliens. Um, they look like Nordic or Caucasians and they are reported. Then there are the reptilians, similar to what we see in the Garden of Eden, um, the, the serpents. And then there are the greys, which I have depicted here. And the, there seems to be a hierarchy. Um, the hierarchy seems to be that the Nordics are over the greys in many cases. Very few cases I've heard of have the reptilians and the greys together. And supposedly the reptilians don't get along with the Nordics. And there's this whole thing going on, right? 
in the hierarchy. And in some cases, people have said they saw the reptilians, the greys and the Nordics together. So something is strange is going on. Right. And then in some cases, people have reported that they have rebuked these in the name of Christ and they have gone away and the abduction has stopped. So it gets into a weird spiritual element now, because if these are just regular, you know, entities, why are they being rebuked in the name of Christ? And then some people are saying the grays seem mechanical and they seem like they are housing spirits. And we covered that the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim became the demons. And so if the demons need to inhabit a body, what do they do? Some people believe that they created not them, but the the fallen angels created bodies for them to inhabit. And if you again watch Stargate. You will see that the Asgard, who are the greys, are actually um, bodies and they transfer their consciousness into the bodies. They aren't actual. Um, they weren't born in those bodies, I'll put it that way. And so you see certain facial similarities to these. And I just find it interesting that they claim to be descendants of the Nephilim. And I find it interesting that on the right, if you get deep into those Christian circles, you will find that people believe these are the spirits of the Nephilim that these these um, grays are vehicles for the spirits of the Nephilim and not actual born bodies, but created bodies. Anyway, we'll get more into that later. Now, this is Myanmar. It's in Asia. Now, the reason this is interesting, because people keep asking. People keep asking, how did certain people change skin color? And we're going to get into that more in the Gentile study. But. For those of you who have dabbled in the DNA stuff, you know that certain people have a lot of Neanderthal. What are Neanderthals? Why were they there? What is it that was going on in Europe? And why were the Europeans mixing with something other than humans? So we're going to get into that. And again, as I said before, I'm no expert in DNA. I don't pretend to be an expert in DNA. I don't talk a lot about DNA. And thank you for all the people who um, on the Gentile study did send me those links. Because like I told you, I wasn't 100 percent sure that what I was saying was correct about the DNA. So thank you to all the people who were being helpful to the people who were not being helpful and being mad that I said it again. Go back and listen. Use your comprehension skills. I said, hey, I might be wrong. I'm probably wrong. But drop the links in the description and I'll do my research and I'll update it next part. So, yeah, on that next Gentile study, I will update what I said, as I said, I would. And again, thank you to all the people who dropped links for me to go check that out and research it and study it um, so I can step my game up on that. But, yeah, they are located here in Asia, in Myanmar. So we have groups of people claiming that they were mixing with angel human hybrids. And then we see the DNA coming out of this area says that they were mixing with something over here. Neanderthals. So there are giants in the land. And we see this in Deuteronomy chapter two, verse 10 through 11 in the promised land. It says the Emims, we covered them briefly, dwelt there in times past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims, which also were accounted giants. So these were also giants. So. There's a lot of giant activity going on in there, meaning that there were angels intentionally targeting this area. Again, I keep talking about spiritual warfare, spiritual warfare sometimes manifests into the physical realm. If you go watch strange stories in the Bible, part one, and talk about the lying spirit that God started taking volunteers and a spirit stepped forth and said, hey, I'll go down and lie in the mouth of the prophet so we can convince them to send the king to war so he can die. And now you see that these fallen angels and we're going to get we're going to talk more about this i don't want to get sidetracked into the fallen angel stuff i'm gonna cover this in the study but there seems to be a, a an attempt to thwart their punishment in the lake of fire and you'll see this attempt become targeted all throughout scripture and you see different things that begin to happen and you're like wait a minute this isn't random this isn't just the devil made my tire blow out on the freeway or all this stuff is not random. It's it's very well calculated what they're doing to attempt um, to stop certain things. Then we have in Deuteronomy chapter two, verse 21. That also was accounted the land of the giants. Giants dwelt there in old time and the Amorites called them Zamzumims. So now we get another um, name. And I pointed to before that some people equate them with the Zuzims in um, Genesis 14. A, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims, but the Lord destroyed them from before them destroyed them before them and they succeeded them and they dwelt in their stead. So the giants were in the land and God is going to wipe out 
most or the, the people are going to go in and wipe out most of the giants through the Lord's power. Right. Most. Again, I said most because we're talking about genealogies here and stuff that's going on in the Old Testament and the fact that giants can have children. And so the Nephilim, people will say, well, God wiped out all the Nephilim. And again, you have these group of people in Myanmar claiming to be descendants of the Nephilim and they blend in with regular humans. So what happened? It said there was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath and in Ashdod there remained. So there are Nephilim left. This is Joshua chapter 11, verse 22. Again, there was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod. This is important right here. So when you get to 2 Samuel 21, 22, and you see David and Goliath and all these other giants, Goliath has four brothers, and there's at least five giants, and then they are born to a giant. You're like, wait a minute, where did all these giants come from? I thought they wiped out the giants. It says, these four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. They are in Gath because in Joshua, we learned that there were giants still living in Gaza and in Gath and in Ashdod. So now we understand that there is a link because right here it says none of the Anakims were left. There's a link between Goliath and the Anakim. So it was Goliath and Anakim. See, this is why it's important to understand the genealogies and read the entire Bible before teaching doctrine and latching on to doctrine and trying to defend doctrine and getting mad when somebody says something that doesn't agree with your doctrine when you haven't read the whole book yet. So a lot of people will get mad and say, well, these weren't literal giants and there's no proof of giant genealogy and all this other stuff. And yet there is there's proof of giant genealogy starting in Genesis chapter six. We get it again in Genesis chapter 14. We see it again in Numbers 13. We see it in the book of Joshua and we see it in the book of Samuel. There's a giant genealogy stretched throughout the Bible. So now Goliath is in Gath and I'll read this first. Um, first Samuel chapter 17 verse one. Now, remember, I read second Samuel already. This is this is the reference to Goli Goliath's four brothers. It says now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together in Shaco, which belongeth to Judah and pitched between Shaco and Azekah in Ephesadamim. Yeah, I'm probably butchering all this. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Ella. Uh, Ella is an Aramaic word, which means God and set the battle and it's actually in a singular form um, set the battle in array against the Philistines and the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them and there went out a champion out of the group of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath whose height was six cubits and a span so we see that Goliath is from Gath and he had a helmet of brass upon his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. All right. So Goliath has a ton of armor and he has a shield bearer, a whole person just to hold his shield. Because he has all this armor. And on the right, the picture you're seeing right there is Jack the Giant Slayer. Um, Jack and the Beanstalk. You'll, you'll, it's a lot of Jack stories. If you start to dig throughout history, uh, the legend of Jack the Giant Slayer is a thing. And we might talk about some of the, some of the outside Bible uh, legends more. I'm not sure yet, but because um, there's a lot to cover in this series. So I don't want to make this series forever long. But anyway, back on to the story. So Goliath is a giant. He's from Gath. So we see that is consistent right here with Joshua uh, chapter 11, verse 22. Only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod, they remained. And then we see in 2 Samuel 22, or 2 Samuel 21, verse 22, these four were born to the giant in Gath. So we know that there's the giant in Gath, just like Joshua said. And so now we understand the origin of Goliath. He was born to a giant that was in Gath. The reason that there's in Gath is because the children of Israel had killed all the giants except for the ones in Gath, in Gaza, and um, Ashdod. So let's talk about Goliath's height, since some people say that this is 
Um, hold on, let me uh, do this real quick. I did want to calculate something real quick. Um, just because I'm, I don't think I put it in here. Yeah, um, they didn't give us the information, but never mind. That's why I didn't put it in there. Okay. So anyway, how tall was Goliath? Some some people say that these giants are allegorical. They weren't literal, and therefore these sometimes represent giant sins or giant problems. I mean, people come up with all kind of twisted ways to avoid what the Bible actually says. Um, I'm not gonna get too far into that. So a standard cubit is 18 inches. A span is half a cubit, which is nine inches. And again, we're talking about standard. So six cubits times 18 inches or six times 18 would equal 108 inches. 108 inches divided by 12 inches in a foot. That means Goliath was nine feet tall. And then you have a span, which is half of a, um, a half of a cubit, which is nine inches. So that would put Goliath at nine feet, nine inches tall. That's on the lower side. Now, some people make these drastic leaps and say Goliath was like, I don't know, crazy tall. So how they get that, I don't know. So the royal cubit, you have an Egyptian royal cubit, which is, again, likely that they used one or the other. Um, they just came out of Egypt. So the Hebrew cubit is 18 inches. The Egyptian royal cubit, if I'm not mistaken, is 20 inches. And so that would make a span 10 inches because a, a span is half a cubit. Now, if you do that calculation, six cubits times 20 inches equals 120 inches. 120 inches divided by 12 feet, 12 inches in a foot gives you 10 feet. And then a span would be half a cubit. So Goliath would have been anywhere from nine foot nine to 10 foot 10. So he was a literal giant. Now, th again, this is another way of telling you um, that he's a giant because they give you literal measurements. Now, understand that between Joshua and um, David, we don't know how many giants were born, but Goliath would have at minimum been a fourth or fifth generation Nephilim because we had Arba and then we had Anak. We had the sons of Anak and then we have the giants that are left. And then we have a span of time between Joshua and David. And according to Samuel, second Samuel, there was a giant in Gath. So, he had children so that giant if he was a third generation himself goliath was either fourth or fifth generation nephilim maybe further out i don't know but we see that again the nephilim aren't sterile and that there's a full genealogy and everything can be accounted for from beginning to end except for the origin of arba but we know that arba is a nephilim and we know that nephilim are made when an angel comes down and has sex with a human woman and we're going to get into some of the alien abduction stories when we get more into the angels. And we'll talk about matter of fact, we actually might talk about that during this series a little bit um, because of the offspring being produced. People are saying that they're being kidnapped, abducted, raped, and then they're shown kids later um, that seem to be hybrids between these so-called aliens and humans. We see that some people said they have encountered beings on boards that they believe are hybrid uh, alien humans. And so this has not stopped. And Christ said in Matthew 24, as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the son of man be. Ask yourself if this is not, if there's no truth to this, why are we still in 2020 telling the same stories? Why? There's no real explanation for it. All right. So let's talk about the weight of Goliath's gear. So his chain mail armor weighed 5,000 shekels. The staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. His spearhead weighs 600 shekels. And so one shekel equals 14.1 grams. So I did all these calculations. I actually did this in my book in the days as the days of Noah were in uh, 2010. And then I updated it again in 2012 or 2013 uh, with the second edition. Goliath's upper body armor weighs 70,500 grams or 155.425 pounds. It's a lot of armor. And remember, he has to maneuver in all this and fight and not die. His spearhead weighed 8,460 grams. Or 18.65 pounds. So what are we up to? 173 pounds worth of equi equipment so far? It says the diameter of a weaver's beam ranges from 2 to 2.5 inches. And they are 2 meters or 6.56 feet long. So... 
we don't know what it was made out of. We don't know what kind of material the weaver, the, the spear was made out of, but it had weight to it as well. So he's already in 173 pounds of armor. We have not calculated his helmet because it didn't tell us how much his helmet weighed. We didn't calculate his leg greaves that he had on. So there are other parts to his armor that aren't calculated. He had likely over 200 pounds of armor on. 200 pounds of armor. Now, in my book, I talk about um, how much weight the average soldier carries. And it's an interesting comparison because they have a lot of gear that's extra that that would not have been um, carried by cultures during this time. They didn't have technological gear and all this other stuff they had to carry. So this was straight armor and weaponry that Goliath was carrying around 200 pounds. The average man is not going to try to maneuver and fight with 200 pounds of encumbrance. These people were scared of a of a man in 200 pounds worth of armor. His maneuverability to me would have been hampered if he was a regular human. So we know Goliath was a giant. So here we have Capdois. He's a Patagonian giant. Um, it's a mythology that may or may not have been confirmed. I'm pretty sure it was not real because uh, <laughs> it was featured. I think it was P.T. Barnum that featured the corpse. Uh, but this was a legend. So I don't know if the giant itself was real. I'll just say this. The P.T. Barnum exhibit, I do not believe was real. You guys can Google and check that out on your own if you want to. <clears throat> so. We know the giants were literal because they used simile. Simile was used to describe the height of the giants. Um, and when they said we look like grasshoppers. And then uh, there's another one that says they were tall as the cedars. Um, it refers to the other giants being as tall as the Anakim. So they used simile to get across their point. They used literalism. They gave the exact heights and measurements to corroborate the story. They give us a full genealogy starting after the after um, they leave Egypt, starting from the book of numbers, we get a full genealogy of giants that runs all the way through this book of second Samuel. So these were literal giants that people are afraid of. And the the response to them is the same every time we see that in the um, in the book of numbers, the people were fearful and they started to cry and pray all night. And they didn't want to go in and fight. We see that in the book of Samuel that nobody wanted to go fight this giant because he comes of the Nephilim. And so David was the only one afraid to go, just like Joshua and Caleb, you know, weren't afraid to go. David was the only one that wasn't afraid to go. And so he, he was like, I'll go kill him because there were certain people who didn't care about the stature or height or the legends or any of that stuff. The most high empowered them to become victorious against all odds. So coming up in this series, well, let's first address it. We've covered the Nimrod Nephilim conspiracy that uh, Nimrod was really a Nephilim. We've covered Sodom and Gomorrah and their giant allies. We just started covering giants in the promised land. There are more giants that we're going to talk about. So far, we've talked about the Anakin. We talked about Arba. We talked about Anak. We talked about Ahiman, Shishai, Talmai, and we talked about Goliath. We have not yet talked about his four brothers. We have not yet talked about Sihon, king of the Amorites. We have not talked about Og, king of Bashan. So we got more giants in the promised land to cover. Um, we're going to get more in depth in the David and Goliath story because that's going to lead us into uh, Goliath's four brothers. We're going to talk about the lion like men of Moab. Who are the Ariel? The A-R-I-E-L, the Ariel, the lion like men of Moab. That name actually means lioness or lion of God. Who are they? Why can they run upon the mountain like deer? They were they were part of David's. Um, I think David had some in his um, army, but they killed one. Yeah, we'll talk about that. And then we're going to talk about some of the hard evidence that exists for giants. We're going to talk about some of the discoveries, some of the stories. We're going to talk about some of the monuments. Uh, we'll probably do that over two, two parts, um, two, maybe three parts. So there's a lot more coming up in this series. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button, please. Make sure you click the subscription button if you're not already subscribed and make sure you hit the notification bell and click all notifications if you want to be notified when I put out any videos. So that's it for now. And with that said, until next time, I'm out.